A couple episodes ago, I reviewed the movie Rotor, which is sometimes considered to be a so-bad-it's-good movie, but that I thought had too many dead spots with nothing happening to really qualify. To me, the most entertaining kinds of bad movies are the ones with lots of crazy shit happening. Well, now I'm gonna talk about another Best Wars type movie. So does this one have lots of crazy shit in it? This is gonna be fun. Night Train to Terror is a 1985 horror anthology film, and honestly, simply describing it like that doesn't really do this movie justice. It's such a weird mishmash of different stories and ideas that you pretty much have to see it for yourself to get what it's all about. And even then, you've only got like a 50-50 chance of actually understanding this thing. Okay, if it seems like I'm overselling it, believe me, I am not. There is enough batshit insanity in this thing for several different movies. And as we'll find out later, there's actually a very good reason for that. So what do you say we stop wasting time and just get right to the movie? You know you're in trouble when even the movie's title seems to be flashing you a warning light. No, at least it's starting out like Horror Express, and that movie was something of a hidden gem. This movie is kind of a hidden gem too, just for very different reasons. Alright, get ready for terror. music video, apparently. We're only a minute in and this movie already doesn't make any sense. That's pretty impressive, actually. Everybody's got something to do. Everybody but you. Yeah, because when I think horror, the first thing I think of is a Loverboy cover band. I've heard of trains providing entertainment, but this seems like a bit much. Ugh, would you kids get out of the way? I'm trying not to die first here. The train is apparently headed for Las Vegas, although by the looks of it, they're actually in outer space. The only other passengers besides the band seems to be these two, Anorexic Santa Claus and, uh, who is this other guy? The night porter will see to everything, Mr. Satan. Exactly. Hmm, I wonder if he's the villain. God and the Devil are both on the train, apparently so they can discuss whose side mankind will ultimately choose. Highway is much more fun. I offer adultery, alcohol, tobacco, cocaine. Incidentally, Satan was also a producer on this movie. All you can offer is a short ride on Earth. My road goes on forever. Well, sure, but is there cocaine? At least there's movies on this train ride. Unfortunately, they're all night train to terror. So our first story involves a man who's about to get married. However, before he does that, he's got to get his bride baptized first. And what the hell? John Philip Law? Aw, oh, come on, man. You were in Alienator. Wait, uh, you were in the Golden Voyage of Sinbad. I'm Dr. Fargo, a psychiatrist. I'll see you tomorrow, Harry. Remember, if you have to shit, just go through the hole in the bed. I'm not really sure what's going on here. One minute he's driving his car into a river, and the next he's in a sanitarium with no explanation of how he got there. I guess the movie's hoping if they throw some tits in right away, nobody will ask any questions. Alright, John, maybe this'll convince you doing space mutiny is a good idea. In addition to John Philip Law, this segment also stars Richard Maul from Night Court, and I'm beginning to think Bull Shannon shaved his head and became a bailiff to cover up the fact that he used to kidnap and torture random people. I'm not so sure about this place's methods. A pill. When swallowed, a person remains unconscious for hours. This was only one of many methods Dr. Brewer instructed Harry Billings to use. Wait, so part of his treatment involves going out and roofing old-timey gangsters? How the hell is that supposed to help him? Hey, you're a fast drinker. Well, hey, he's gotta get through this movie somehow. Besides, I don't think John's got his eyes on the bartender. Hey, Slick. Drinks are on me. 
They then got a hotel room and John gave him the Pygar special. That's where you dress up like an angel and fuck somebody with your wings. Actually, I guess he kidnaps the bartender, I think? They never actually show him doing that. Oh well, here, have some more tits. Steve Harvey said the best place to meet a nice girl is a church, but considering this results in her getting drugged and then molested by Richard Maul, I'm surprised Bill Cosby wasn't the one who said that. And apparently Richard Maul is about to molest Sheena, Queen of the Jungle now? At this point, you may have noticed that this movie seems a little disjointed. Well, there's a reason for that. That's because each segment is actually made up of footage from three different feature-length movies which were then edited down to create an anthology, with the framing segments on the train being the only part specifically shot for this movie. This first segment was taken from an unfinished horror movie called Scream Your Head Off, but as you're about to see, taking a feature-length movie and chopping it down to 20 or 30 minutes results in one confusing clusterfuck of an anthology. Seriously, I think the knife on the poster is what this movie was edited with. Either that or Richard Maul's meat clip. Lever. Oh shit, he hit her from 30 feet away! And sorry, John, that wasn't a nightmare. You really are in this movie. At least your doctor has good bedside manner. And by that I mean she's actually on your bedside. I'm only trying to cure you. Of what? Reckless driving? I still don't know how the hell he even got here! So, I guess John Philip Law is drugging and kidnapping women for Richard Maul to go all hostile on as punishment for killing his wife earlier? What the hell kind of sense does that make? I can see why people don't have faith in our justice system. Also, apparently Richard Maul tortures people with a spatula. Can somebody please tell me what in the hell is going on here? The victims were kidnapped, tortured, and finally murdered. And then the evil doctors would sell the body parts to medical schools all around the world. Oh, so that's why med school costs an arm and a leg. Oh, and I guess John's doctor is roofing people now, too? I have no idea why. There's no context for any of this. But at least now I know where Futurama got the idea for the head museum from. Eventually, John gets tired of this shit and decides to take matters into his own hands. And by that, I mean he runs around while the old man and Franken patient here take care of the doctor. First, though, John Philip Law and Richard Maul battle it out to see who's the tallest, lankiest actor of them all. The answer to that is Richard's the tallest, but John's the lankiest. Decapitation! Alright, Richard Maul's dead, which is the closest we're gonna get to an ending to this segment. Oh, wasn't that lovely? <laughs> yeah, I guess. Seemed like a lot was missing to me. The devil decides that the people in the story were evil and that their souls belonged to him. Okay, pretty sure I could have told you that. Anyway, what about the musicians on the train? You call that music? Some of it is quite touching. Yeah, I'll say. Come on, dance with me, dance with me. Now, admittedly, they are kind of a one-hit wonder, but it is pretty catchy. By the way, if my green slime video made that movie's theme song get stuck in your head, don't worry, here's something to replace it. Mr. Night Porter, when do we get to Las Vegas? One hour, if there's no delay. But what could delay us? Well, this guy's pink eye for one thing. Looks like it's time for our second story. And now, the case of Greta Connors. This segment was edited from a movie called The Dark Side to Love, although something tells me the movie going from day to night in between edits was probably in the original movie too. So, I'm assuming this guy is Greta? Popcorn, mister? Little girl? Where have you been all my life? Little girl? She's like 30. And you can stuff bills down her chest as much as you want, pal. She's just gonna take the money and still not fuck you. Actually, this technique apparently does work, as Greta decides to go with this guy. It's your classic story of boy meets girl, boy makes girl star in Davy Crockett porn for frat bros to ogle. Ah, truly a tale as old as time. This is Glenn Marshall. He saw Greta in one of Young Meyer's movies. It was love at first sight. And by that he means it gave him a boner. 
Boy, who would have guessed that a guy who owns a rape van would immediately become obsessed with a woman and start stalking her? And I guess these two are a couple now? I say I guess because one minute he's just meeting her and the very next scene they're together. This is what happens when you get the Cliff's Notes version of horror movies minus the notes. I'm just waiting for this to turn into an edited version of The Fun House. At least that way I'd be watching a confusing version of a good horror movie. Needless to say, Greta having a new boyfriend doesn't go over well with Mr. Porn Director here. He didn't buy all that popcorn just to have her go off with some other guy, you know. Well, when your girlfriend's cheating on you, there's only one course of action. You throw a party at your castle and invite a Jimi Hendrix impersonator. Hey, makes sense to me. So, what's happening at this party? This is our dangerous little friend. What, a giant wasp? That's lame. Everyone knows the best parties always involve giant scorpions. It has but a single sting, the sting of death. They play a game that's like Russian Roulette, where they try and see if the wasp will sting anybody, because I guess people had to do something at parties before Cards Against Humanity. Admittedly, the stop-motion effects here aren't the greatest, but once everybody gets enough drinks in them, they'll look like Ray Harryhausen. Also, if the wasp stings you, does that mean you win? That kind of seems like a shitty prize. Not that it matters, since the wasp flies out the window anyway, where it proceeded to lay thousands of eggs and overrun the planet. Or maybe it just cock-blocked this guy. Ooh, baby, your kisses make me feel like my face is about to explode. You'd think Greta's boyfriend would leave after this, but, eh, open bar. So what game's next? I am the Contessa's electrocution computer. When I light yellow, a mild electrical shock will discharge to one of the club members. Oh look, it's the HAL Atari 2600. Ah, uh, come on, guys. I thought it was coming over for a swingers party, not to reenact an old Simpsons episode. Don't it give you a charge to think you, uh, might see me blow out? Yeah, thanks, fake Columbia. Man, people really would do anything in the 80s to get an orgasm, wouldn't they? And I think they might have the machine turned up a little too high. <laughs> Oh no, they just killed Afro Ninja! The plot against Glenn failed. Hey, here's an idea. Why don't you just shoot him? Or just send some extras from the Warriors to go kill him, whichever's easier. And sorry, Glenn, all the karate classes in the world won't help when you have the same weaknesses as a lobster. Looks like this guy's taking Greta and Glenn to be tortured at an Elks Lodge now. Although again, if you want these two dead, just shoot them already. Even a 1960s Batman villain would say your death traps are needlessly convoluted. You know a villain has a bad plan when it depends on his victims not being able to escape a sleeping bag. <laughs> Um, partial decapitation? And was that seriously the end? Greta went off with the nice young man and lived happily ever after. Okay, well, I guess everything worked out for him in the end. At least until Greta walks off with another guy immediately after meeting him again. I think God might be getting a little frustrated with Satan. At one point, he gets so angry, he cranks up the brightness level on his suit. Anyway, how's the band doing? Hey, George, I'm starving. How about some hamburgers and beer? There's no food on this train. This is a jet blue train. If Blondie's Rapture helped to make hip-hop whiter, then this movie helped make breakdancing Wonder Bread. Come on, dance with me, dance with me. Dance with me, dance with me. Yeah, when I said that song was gonna get stuck in your head earlier, I fucking meant it. Okay, time to get to our last story. And I don't know if you two should be watching this woman masturbate, even if she does apparently have a Nazi fetish. This last segment was taken from a movie called Cataclysm, which despite what it looks like, isn't a 70s Italian Nazi exploitation movie. Instead, most of it is set in the present day, and hey, Cameron Mitchell's in this movie. I was wondering when he was gonna show up. Ah, Cameron Mitchell. It just wouldn't be an 80s so bad it's good movie without you. Cameron plays a police officer who's helping a former concentration camp victim track down a Nazi officer who's escaped justice. Although I'm not sure what David Cassidy has to do with any of this. Why can't you arrest a murderer? Because all this happened many years ago in yeah. Germany. We yeah. have no jurisdiction. 
Exactly. That's why after World War II, absolutely no Nazi war criminals have ever been arrested. I think I know why this guy's so desperate to see war criminals brought to justice. By the looks of it, he was killed in World War II. He tells Cameron he's found Nazi officer Heinrich von Rapeface here, who somehow hasn't aged since World War II. That guy we saw in the theater. Facelift, plastic surgery, all. I mean, nothing could make a 60, 70 year old man look that young. Well, don't be so sure. Some of the Nazis' biggest scientific achievements were in plastic surgery. I mean, just look at all the ones that went to Brazil and invented the butt lift. Cameron tells the old man he can't do anything without proof, which means he has no choice but to take things into his own hands. Also, I think this just became a live-action Wolfenstein adaptation. Oh, never mind, it's just a shitty 90s FMV game. I'm beginning to think this guy might be more than just an ex-Nazi, since not only does he kill the old man, but he also tattooed 999 on his body. What the hell? Richard Maul again? Is he like the Stan Lee cameo of this movie? I'm asking because his hair can't seem to decide if he's playing Doctor Strange or Rogue from X-Men. So I guess this story's about Richard Maul selling books now? Indeed it now appears that Jesus Christ, as we know him in the scriptures, never existed. I propose to build a culture upon the premise that God is dead. Ah, great. Now David A.R. White's gonna produce a movie series rebutting this guy. Richard's book seems to be a success. Stanley Kubrick even drops by to see if he can direct a film adaptation. Wait a second, that's not Stanley Kubrick. Look at this, Dr. Hansen. <laughs> Yeah, nice tattoo, but did you have to be naked under your trench coat? He tells Richard that Satan is after him, but he's got nothing to worry about. If anything, Satan will just give him some cocaine. And that's not the only weird thing going on. Okay, between this and the Nazis at the beginning, this woman has some really weird sex dreams. Well, looks like there's evil forces at play, so everybody disco! Yeah, you can tell this is a happening party because they hired my Aunt Ruthie as a stripper. One of the waitresses catches the eye of Nazi, demon, whoever the hell this guy is. Hopefully he can please her as much as these other two ladies he's with. Hey baby, did you know my shirt's made of the same material as my underwear? Whoa, baby, take it easy. I mean, you know what they say about guys with horse feet, don't you? And that's the end of that plotline. Probably for the best. Cameron Mitchell drops by to ask if he's still involved in this story or if he can collect his paycheck and go home. And then whoever this guy is decides to break in. Do any of these plot lines have anything to do with each other? It feels like they edited another movie into this already edited movie. <laughs> Oh shit, he entered the claymation room. And that's all the stop motion they could afford to show us. I still don't know why Satan is after Richard Maul. He said God was dead, not you. Come to think of it, if this story does involve Satan, shouldn't he already know how it plays out? Why is he watching it again? And if you thought stop motion wasps and teen idol Nazis were scary, get a load of this. That's right, killer walk-in closet. Some people have skeletons in their closet, this lady has zombies. It all works out though, so guess there's no need to move. Perhaps disturbed by what's happening, Richard Maul's wife decides to visit a priest, although personally I wouldn't trust this guy since he has a portal to a nether realm in his church. It is an ancient box made of the true wood of the cross. So what you're saying is, truly that is the box of a carpenter. Is your mission to remove the heart of the devil's demon and secure it in this holiest of vessels. I do it myself, but you know, I have a church picnic to prepare for this weekend. Oh, looks like Hobo Rasputin's back in the movie. Is he gonna be the next guy whose plot thread ends with him getting horribly killed? Have you come to challenge me? I came to do battle. You are a defunct monk. Wait, he's a what? You are a defunct monk. 
That makes sense. He does look like he gets a little handsy with kids. Get ready for a battle between crazy monk guy and this lady we've never seen before now. I don't know. In the eyes of God, I command you to tell me your name! I am Ishtar. Oh shit, she's a shitty 1987 comedy movie. And did this guy seriously say he came prepared to do battle with the forces of darkness without so much as a pair of brass knuckles? What the hell did he think was gonna happen? Well, it looks like Ishtar managed to scrounge up some more stop motion money, which means this guy is screwed. <laughs> Meanwhile, looks like Cameron Mitchell's still trying to figure out what he's still doing in this story. Why'd he call you? To warn me. Against what? Satan. Who? Gee, I wonder who she could be talking about. Could it be... Satan? Cameron asks Olivier if he killed the monk, and he says no. Can't imagine a disciple of Satan lying, so guess that clears that up. You know, you've got some kind of a fix on that guy. He hasn't done a damn thing. Yeah, thanks. Who the fuck are you? But wait a second, Cameron figures out that Olivier is actually much older than he appears. Ah, oh, if only the old man from the beginning had told him that, he could have figured this out a lot sooner. Plus, I think he's slowly turning into Gary Newman. Uh, hey, it's Richard Mall. Uh, do I have anything to do with the rest of what's going on, or what? And listen, Cameron, whenever somebody tries to resolve their plotline in this movie, it usually results in them getting killed. I'd just take your paycheck and get to your Raw Force audition if I were you. Open. Open! Open! Damn, everyone knows Satan's the master of childproof doors. I don't know what this guy's problem is. This just looks like my car from high school. Peter! Oh shit, Cameron Mitchell just got stock footage to death. No, oh, right, Richard Mall. I guess it's time he was involved in this story too. We too believe God is dead. Just who are you? There is only one master, and his name is Satan. I don't believe in Satan any more than I believe in God. Look, Richard, just say you believe in Satan and then we can start the orgy, okay? Richard may not believe in Satan, but he will believe in the god of claymation. And as punishment, Satan turns him into a character from Team America World Police. Yeah, that's for saying God is dead. Which you would think Satan would actually like, but whatever. Good thing his wife still has that box the priest gave her, which apparently houses Marcellus Wallace's soul. Alright, if you're gonna kill a demon, it is gonna require skill and subtlety. <laughs> or just run him the fuck over. I guess that works too. And why the hell'd you bring him to a hospital? Just cut his heart out, who cares if it's a little messy? <laughs> See? This lady's got the right idea. Stop it! Why? Do you want to kill this guy or not? Alright, you got his heart, so does that mean he's dead now? Outside! Whoops, turns out the priest was wrong. You were actually supposed to put his pancreas in the box. Ah eh, well, live and learn, I suppose. And thus ends another inexplicable, choppily edited tale. Gentlemen, it's dawn. Dawn where? On Pluto? You're still in outer space! And in case you were wondering, yes, the band is still playing the same song. Sweet Jesus, even Fish doesn't extend their songs like this. They stop playing after the train suddenly crashes, but hey, at least this way they don't have to do any encores. Besides, it doesn't matter anyway since God just immediately brings them back to life. Come on, dance with me, dance with me. I'm sorry, Satan, but I'm afraid that Dance With Me song is my jam. And so ends the weirdest Galaxy Express 3.9 adaptation ever conceived. So that's Night Train to Terror, and wow, that... that was really something. I mean, I'm still trying to figure out exactly what, but it was definitely something.
Just one of the movies they used for the segments here could have given me enough for an episode of this show, but when you chop them up to the point where they don't make sense, put them together and then add a framing story that also doesn't make any goddamn sense, and you've just arrived at hilariously bad movie Nirvana. There is so much going on here, it's almost like watching a horror movie greatest hits collection, except in this case, they just took three Z-grade movies, put them in a blender, and hoped it would make a coherent movie. It doesn't, of course, but that's a big part of what makes it so entertaining. You may not always know what the hell is going on in this movie, but you probably won't be bored by it. Plus, it also gave us another catchy bad movie song to go along with ones like Hear the Engines Roll Now, Against the Ninja, and the Green Slime theme. And just to make doubly sure it's caught in your head... Come on, dance with me, dance with me. Dance with me, dance with me. Well, that's all for now. Until next time. Her bus hadn't broken down, you know? No way! I think this train is cool!